The Russian Revolution by Rosa Luxemburg, Chapter 3, The Nationalities Question. The Bolsheviks are in part responsible for the fact that the military defeat was transformed into the collapse and breakdown of Russia. Moreover, the Bolsheviks themselves have, to a great extent, sharpened the objective difficulties of this situation by a slogan which they placed in the foreground of their policies, the so-called right of self-determination of peoples, or something which was really implicit in this slogan, the disintegration of Russia. The formula of the right of the various nationalities of the Russian Empire to determine their fate independently, even to the point of the right of governmental separation from Russia, was proclaimed again with doctrinaire obstinacy as a special battle cry of Lenin and his comrades during their opposition against Milyukovist and then Kerenskian imperialism. It constituted the axis of their inner policy after the October Revolution also, and it constituted the entire platform of the Bolsheviks at Brest-Litovsk, all they had to oppose to the display of force by German imperialism. One is immediately struck with the obstinacy and rigid consistency with which Lenin and his comrades struck to the slogan, a slogan which is in sharp contradiction to their otherwise outspoken centralism in politics as well as to the attitude they have assumed towards other democratic principles. While they showed a quite cool contempt for the constituent assembly, universal suffrage, freedom of press and assemblage, in short, for the whole apparatus of the basic democratic liberties of the people, which, taken all together, constituted the right of self-determination inside Russia. They treated the right of self-determination of peoples as a jewel of democratic policy for the sake of which all practical considerations of real criticism had to be stilled. While they did not permit themselves to be imposed upon in the slightest by the plebiscite for the Constituent Assembly in Russia, a plebiscite on the basis of the most democratic suffrage in the world carried out in the full freedom of a popular republic. And while they simply declared this pleb plebiscite null and void on the basis of a very sober evaluation of its results, still they championed the popular vote of the foreign nationalities of Russia on the question of which land they wanted to belong to. As the true pal palladium of all freedom and democracy, the unadulter unadulterated quint quintessence of the will of the peoples and as the court of last resort in questions of the political fate of nations. The contradiction that is so obvious here is all the harder to understand since the democratic forms of political life in each land, as we shall see, actually involve the most valuable and even indispensable foundations of socialist policy whereas the famous right of self-determination of nations is nothing but hollow, petty bourgeois phraseology and humbug. Indeed, what is this right supposed to signify? It belongs to the ABC of socialist policy that socialism opposes every form of oppression, including also that of one nation by another. If, despite all this, such generally sober and critical politicians as Lenin and Trotsky and their friends, who have nothing but an ironical shrug for every sort of utopian phrase such as disarmament, League of Nations, etc., have in this case made a hollow phrase of exactly the same kind into their special hobby, this arose, it seems to us, as a result of some kind of policy made to order for the occasion. Lenin and his comrades clearly calculated that there was no surer method of binding the many foreign peoples within the Russian Empire to the cause of the revolution, to the cause of the socialist proletariat, than that of offering them in the name of the revolution and of socialism, the most extreme and most unlimited freedom to determine their own fate. This was analogous to the policy of the Bolsheviks towards the Russian peasants, whose land hunger was satisfied by the slogan of direct seizure of the noble estates and who were supposed to be bound thereby to the banner of the revolution and the proletarian government. In both cases, unfortunately, the calculation was entirely wrong. While Lenin and his comrades clearly expected that, as champions of national freedom, even to the extent of separation, they would turn Finland, the Ukraine, 
Poland, Lithuania, the Baltic countries, the Caucasus, etc., and to so many faithful allies of the Russian Revolution, we have instead witnessed the opposite spectacle. One after another, these nations used the freshly granted freedom to ally themselves with German imperialism against the Russian Revolution as its mortal enemy, and under German protection to carry the banner of counter-revolution into Russia itself. The little game with the Ukraine at Brest, which caused a decisive turn of, of affairs in those negotiations and brought about the entire inner and outer political situation at present pre prevailing for the Bolsheviks, is a perfect case in point. The conduct of Finland, Poland, Lithuania, the Baltic lands, the peoples of the Caucasus, shows most convincingly that we are not dealing here with an exceptional case, but with a typical phenomenon. To be sure, in all these cases, it was really not the people who engaged in these reactionary policies, but only the bourgeois and petty bourgeois classes who, in sharpest opposition to their own proletarian masses, perverted the national right of self-determination into an instrument of their counter-revolutionary class politics. But, and here we come to the very heart of the question, it is in this that the utopian petty bourgeois character of this nationalistic slogan resides that in the midst of this crude reality of the crude realities of class society and when class antagonisms are sharpened to the uttermost it is simply converted into a means of bourgeois class rule the bolsheviks were to be taught to their to their own great hurt and that of the revolution that under the rule of capitalism there is no self-determination of peoples that in a class society each class of the nation strives to determine itself in a different fashion and that for the bourgeois classes, the standpoint of national freedom is fully subordinated to that of class rule. The Finnish bourgeoisie, like the Ukrainian bourgeoisie, were unanimous in preferring the violent rule of Germany to national freedom, if the latter should be bound up with Bolshevism. The hope of transforming these actual class relationships somehow into their opposite and of getting a majority vote for union with the Russian Revolution by depending on the revolutionary masses, if it was seriously meant by Lenin and Trotsky, represented an incomprehensible degree of optimism. And it was only meant as a tactical flourish in the duel with the German politics of force. Then it represented dangerous playing with fire. Even without German military occupation, the famous popular plebiscite, supposing that it had come to that in the border states, would have yielded a result in all probability, which would have given the Bolsheviks little cause for rejoicing. For we must take into consideration the psychology of the peasant masses and of great sections of the petty bourgeoisie, and the thousand ways in which the bourgeoisie could have influenced the vote. Indeed, it can be taken as an unbreakable rule in these matters of plebiscites on the national question that the ruling class will either know how to prevent them where it doesn't suit their purpose or where they somehow occur. It will know how to influence the results by all sorts of means, big and little, the same means which make it impossible to introduce socialism by a popular vote. The mere fact that the question of national aspirations and tendencies towards separation were injected at all into the midst of the revolutionary struggle and were even pushed into the foreground and made into the shibboleth of socialist and revolutionary policy as a result of the Brest peace has served to bring the greatest confusion into socialist ranks and has actually destroyed the position of the proletariat in the border countries. In Finland, so long as the socialist proletariat fought as a part of the closed Russian revolutionary phalanx, it possessed a position of dominant power. It had the majority in the Finnish parliament and the army. It had reduced its own bourgeoisie to complete impotence and was master of the situation within its borders. Or take the Ukraine. At the beginning of the century, before the tomfoolery of Ukrainian nationalism with its silver rubles and its universals in Lenin's hobby of an independent Ukraine had been invented. The Ukraine was the stronghold of the Russian revolutionary movement. From there, from Rostov, from Odessa, from the Donetsk region, flowed out the first lava streams of the revolution, as early as 1902 to 1904, which kindled all South Russia into a sea of flame, thereby preparing the uprising of 1905. 
The same thing was repeated in the present revolution in which the South Russian proletariat supplied the picked troops of the proletarian phalanx. Poland and the Baltic lands have been since 1905 the mightiest and most dependable hearths of revolution, and in them the socialist proletariat has played, played an outstanding role. How does it happen then that in all these lands the counter-revolution suddenly triumphs? The nationalist movement, just because it tore the proletariat loose from Russia, crippled it thereby and delivered it into the hands of the bourgeoisie of the border countries. Instead of acting in the same spirit of genuine international class policy which they represented in other matters, instead of working for the most compact union of the revolutionary forces throughout the area of the empire, instead of defending tooth and nail the integrity of the Russian empire as an area of revolution and opposing to all forms of separatism the solidarity and inseparability of the proletarians in all lands within the sphere of the Russian revolution, as the highest command of politics, the Bolsheviks, by their hollow nationalistic phraseology concerning the right of self-determination self to the point of separation, have accomplished quite the contrary and supplied the bourgeoisie in all border states with the finest, the most desirable pretext, the very banner of the counter-revolutionary efforts. Instead of warning the proletariat in the border countries against all forms of separatism as mere bourgeois traps, they did nothing but confuse the masses in all the border countries by their slogan and delivered them up to the demagogy of the bourgeois classes. By this nationalistic demand, they brought on the disintegration of Russia itself, pressed into the enemy's hand the knife which it was to thrust into the heart of the Russian Revolution. To be sure, without the help of German imperialism, without the German rifle butts and German fists, as Kotsky's Newsite put it, the Lubinskys and other little scoundrels of the Ukraine, the Eriks and Mannerheims of Finland, and the Baltic barons would never have gotten the better of the socialist masses of the workers in their respective lands. But national separatism was the Trojan horse inside which the German comrades, bayonet in hand, made their entrance into all those lands. The real class antagonisms and relations of military force brought about German intervention. But the Bolsheviks provided the ideology which masked this campaign of counter-revolution. They strengthened the, po the position of the bourgeoisie and weakened that of the proletariat. The best proof is the Ukraine, which was to play so frightful a role in the fate of the Russian Revolution. Ukrainian nationalism in Russia was something quite different from, let us say, uh, Czechish, <laughs> Polish or Finnish nationalism in that the former was a mere whim, a folly of a few dozen petty bourgeois intellectuals without the slightest roots in the economic, political, or psychological relationships of the country. It was without any historical tradition, since the Ukraine never formed a nation or government, was without any national culture, except for the reactionary romantic poems of Shevchenko. It is exactly as if one fine day the people living in the Wasserkant, <laughs> Wasserkant? should want to found a new low German nation and government. In this ridiculous pose of a few university professors and students was inflated into a political force by Lenin and his comrades through the, their doctrinaire agitation concerning the right of self-determination, including etc. To what was at first a mere farce that lent such importance that the farce became a matter of the most deadly seriousness not as a serious national movement for which afterward as before there are no roots at all but as a shingle and rallying flag of counter-revolution at breast out of this addled egg crept the german bayonets there are times when such phrases have a very real meaning in the history of the class struggles it is the unhappy lot of socialism that in the world war it was given to it to supply the ideological screens for counter-revolutionary policy at the outbreak of the war, German social democracy hastened to deck the predatory expedition of German imperialism with an ideological shield from the lumber room of Marxism, by declaring it to be a liberating expedition against Russian Tsarism, such as our old teachers, Marx and Engels, had longed for, and to the lot of the Bolsheviks, who were the very anti anti antipodes of our government socialists, did it fall to supply grist for the mill of counter-revolution with their phrases about self-determination of peoples, 
and thereby to supply not alone the ideology for the strangling of the Russian Revolution itself, but even for the plans for settling the entire crisis arising out of the World War. We have good reason to examine very carefully the policies of the Bolsheviks in this regard. The right of self-determination of peoples, coupled with the League of Nations and disarmament by the grace of President Wilson, constitute the battle cry under which the coming reckoning of international socialism with the bourgeoisie is to be settled. It is obvious that the phrases concerning self-determination and the entire nationalist movement, which at present constitute the greatest danger for international socialism, have experienced an extraordinary strengthening from the Russian Revolution and the Brest negotiations. We shall yet have to go into this platform thoroughly. The tragic fate of these phrases in the Russian Revolution, on the thorns of which the Bolsheviks were themselves destined to be caught and bloodily scratched, must serve the international proletariat as a warning and lesson. And from this there followed the dictatorship of Germany from the time of the Brest Treaty to the time of the Supplementary Treaty. The 200 ex ex expiatory sacrifices in Moscow. From this situation arose the terror and suppression of democracy.